The Bear Essentials Podcast gives older bears a place to gather for real talk regarding topics and issues that they can relate to. Here at The Bear Essentials, we aren't just having conversations. We are looking to provide actionable intelligence through real-life experience and expertise of our guests. Our mission is to build a strong community that elevates and motivates people to go beyond their limiting beliefs by helping them realize that getting older is not an excuse to hibernate on their goals, but a reason to work harder. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host, Charles Wallace. I am so excited to be bringing you today's guest. He is a former special forces operator. He is currently an emergency medicine doctor. He has written a best-selling book and also was in a television show for the History Channel called Hunting Hitler. So without further ado, let's please welcome Mike Simpson to the show. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Would you uh, mind introducing yourself to the audience? Uh, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Mike Simpson. I'm a doctor of emergency medicine. I live in the great state of Texas uh, with my family. I retired from the United States Army here in 2016 after a 32-year career. Uh, split up about half as a special operations operator and about half as, as a physician uh, in the special operations community directly supporting soft units. And uh, now uh, I'm uh Again, a practicing physician. I'm also an entrepreneur. I have my own life and lifestyle brand, uh, selling supplements and and other things uh, called Graybeard Performance. And uh, I work as a, also as a SWAT physician here on the local and state level. That's fascinating, Mike. Like I said, we talked a little before we started. I mean, you you have a great book out. I've seen you on other things, and, and most importantly for me, and I think for a lot of the you know, especially the men who watch my show and listen. Um, it's that 40, 50, 60 year old crowd. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think we're always looking for an edge. And I think having somebody like you on with your experience really helps to, uh, you know, give some tips and, and, and just gives us that a little additional push that we may need. Um, mm -hmm. let's go back a little bit. So going back was, you know, back into your, you know, high school, things like that was military, something you always wanted to do. You know, I, I think uh, from about middle school on is where I started thinking about it, um, may, maybe a little bit later than that, maybe early high school. I think uh, I think team sports actually had a lot to do with it. I mean, it's, you know, you're you're all uh, you're all wearing the same kit and you're, you're you're lining up and doing exercises together and you're all mission focused. Right. You're you're part of something larger than yourself. So uh, and it's there's even a. Uh, uh, I don't know if you remember the 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 movie from the 1970s. I think it was called One on One with Robbie Benson. Mm. Uh, there's a, there's a, some dialogue in that movie where they talk specifically about the parallels in team sports and and that they're kind of militarized, <laughs> uh, you know, wh whether whether intentional or not. Um, and I think kind of that feeling kind of carried over and it, and it led me to, to look for greater challenges. And again, you know, uh, you know, being the idea of being a part of something that uh, was just so much bigger than myself and, and being able to contribute to that, I think is what, what drew me to being uh, in the military and, you know, the, the opportunity to challenge myself, obviously. And you mentioned team sports where you um, going back into high school, where you, did you play sports? I did. I played, uh, I played football, I played five years of football. So I played, we didn't, uh, most places they call it pop Warner football. It was called youth football where I played. So I played in middle school. Um, I played little league baseball and I, and I ran a season of track and I would, I'm, I'm an absolute awful baseball player. I, and I find the game actually really boring, uh, which is <laughs> why the last year I played, I insisted on playing catcher. Cause I knew it was the only way that, uh, <laughs> being involved constantly was the only way that I could stay interested. Um, it wasn't really until football. I was, you know, I, I, I'm terrible at basketball. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not incredibly coordinated or athletic. Um, but, but I was able to do pretty good at football kind of just based on grit and aggression. Mm -hmm. Cause I've got, I've got a ton of that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I did, I did pretty well. You know, I, 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 I started, uh, in middle school, um, I, I was a, a rotating starter my, my sophomore year. I didn't start as a freshman. Uh, by the time I was a junior and I was playing varsity, 
uh, it was evident that I was way too small to be a middle linebacker and a lineman, which is what I was. Um, so my days of starting were over at that mm-hmm. point. Um, but I, I still enjoy, I enjoyed playing, you know, you know, showing up to practice, uh, showing up to the games, you know, waiting, waiting for my chance to get in the game. Uh, it's, and just being a part of it, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, I really did feel even in games where I didn't play, I felt like, you know, being a part of a team we're we're, we're a team and, you know, we're, we're together in victory and in defeat. Yeah. So Mike, I mean, hearing that you're obviously your career in the military being an emergency emergency medicine doctor how was you know i always love to ask this especially of people that i find extremely intelligent how were your grades back <laughs> i'll let you know if somebody like that comes along <laughs> right <laughs> What was so, your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, you, you got two of us here where the intelligence then, right? Um, so your grades going back into high school. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I know for me, <laughs> I look back and I go, man, I wish I might've tried a little harder. Right. But like, so yeah. sort of like you, I mean, how, how was it? Uh, my grades in high school were pretty abysmal. Um, I did really well uh, in, in grade school and even, I even made honor roll in middle school and about the time, again, that was, you know, middle school, of course, was the first year that I played football. And once I discovered sports, you know, the the, the big, the trifecta that, you know, that kind of got me in trouble was sports, beer, and girls. Uh, I really didn't care about studying anymore. And I, I had the system figured out. It's that um, I could just blow off homework entirely, just not even do homework. And then as long as I got an A or B on the test, I could pass the class. Mm. So that was my philosophy is, you know, that's, you know, why, why should I do more? Uh, And especially, uh, you know, oddly enough, especially once I knew that I I wanted to go in the army, I'm like, well, all I need is a diploma. I don't need, I don't need a certain GPA. I didn't take the SATs in high school, you know, like, like my classmates did. I never had my eye on going to college. Um, and I graduated, I went to a very, very small school. I lived in a, a really small town called Tehachapi, California, a little mountain town. And, uh, we had slightly less than 500 students in my high school. And, uh, I graduated 102 out of 122 in my class. So I was not a stellar, uh, academician as it were. Well, you make me feel better because we're probably in the same <laughs> we're in the same club, man. It's funny you say that because honestly, I it was it was very similar philosophy. And I I knew as I would sit there in class, I'm like, I don't have to do this homework because I, I hear enough that I'll be able to pass the test. But right, you know, yeah. looking back, I just it always amazed me though, because somebody like you, especially going on and becoming a doctor, and it just it it does show show a lot. So when you go you didn't go to college at all. So I, I went to undergraduate. Um, I did my first four years in the army and then I thought I was going to get out and pursue a career in law enforcement. And during that time that I was out, um, I, I dabbled in, in undergraduate and, but unfortunately I, I kind of had a similar philosophy in that, you know, well, I'm just, I'm going to do what it takes to, to, you know, the C's get degrees, right. Is what they tell you. So I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I have to do for this class, you know, to me, my sanity is more intact than me cramming and and staying up all night. So, uh, my grades were, were not stellar in the year that I went to Georgia Southern university. Um, and then later when I, I decided that, Hey, I do need to get an undergraduate degree because I want to be, uh, I want to, I, I either needed enough credits that I could apply to a physician assistant program. Um, that idea got torpedoed because of some uh, some military regulation stuff. But and then I was on track to to you know wanting to go to medical school because I knew that I wanted to continue to work in medicine. I was a, a special forces medic at the time, uh, and I went to Campbell University, went to night school, and that's what I really did apply myself. And I started to realize, hey, grades are important. Not only are grades important, but this all this material is important because you know this is every whether it's biology, organic chemistry, uh, anatomy and physiology. I, I need to know all this stuff mm. because, you know, the more that I know, the better that I'm going to be uh, at at helping sick people. So I need to know as much of it as possible. So uh, luckily, there was enough time between my initial kind of weak attempt at going to college and uh, when I got my degree at Campbell University that they transferred my credits, but they didn't transfer the grades. Mm. So 
that actually was very beneficial for me because at Campbell University, I had a 4.0. So I graduated summa from Campbell, even though uh, if you look at my transcripts from Georgia Southern, I was a, I was a B minus student. Wow. And now, so, and I know the whole connection you were, so the military, you, you Rangers. I spent my first four years in the military, 84 to 88 in first Ranger battalion. Uh, and then I, um, signed up for, uh, one of the national guard special forces groups. Uh, when I got out, uh, I was in 20 special forces group out of Florida. I had not gone to, uh, special forces training yet. Uh, that's a, a whole long story about how I was supposed to go. Then they screwed up my orders. Then I wasn't supposed to go. Then I was supposed to go again and, uh, ended up kicking that can down the road a good bit. And, uh, lo and behold, the first Gulf War kicked off desert storm, desert shield, and we got mobilized. And then once we got mobilized and we went to Fort Bragg, then I had plenty of time. So, uh, three days after getting to Fort Bragg, after mobilizing, I was in special forces assessment and selection and completed SFAS, uh, went to the Q course, uh, earned my tab and beret as a special forces engineer sergeant. And then it was later after a couple years on a team, I, I at that point, I decided to stay on active duty and went to seventh group. And uh, a couple years later, a couple of three years later, I decided that uh, I wanted to cross over and be a medic, which is what I did. So, Mike, where where along the way, like here in just a little bit, right about school? I know we all think back when you're younger, when we're younger about high school, things like that. When when does that switch kind of kick off, though, for you that you're like, you know what, I really I need to change the way I'm going about things. Was there a moment or did, did it just kind of happen? There wasn't I, I don't say there, there was a moment. I think. uh probably the cathartic time period was, uh, you know, I, I went, there was nothing, nothing that I ever did in the military was, uh, to me anyway, was particularly academically challenging. I mean, it, it just, it just wasn't, uh, the SF engineer course, uh, yeah, I, I definitely had to study. Um, there was never a time where I felt I was hanging on by my fingertips or anything like that. Um, there is, I mean, it's, it's engineering, so it's whether you're talking explosives or bridge building, uh, or, you know, uh, what we call theater of operation construction, which is basically, you know, <laughs> building structures. Um, all of that had its challenges and all of it had stuff that I had to memorize and had to learn and had to understand. But uh, again, I was, I was never in a, in a situation where I felt like I'm, I'm barely hanging on here. Mm. Um, it wasn't until I went to the SF medics course and the SF medic course is, notorious it's renowned throughout all the services uh there there was a time uh when i went through um uh ranger medics went through it people in the sf medic pipeline went through it um and seal corman went through it and uh, there was even a time period later where pjs went through it um that for reasons i won't get into that didn't last very long um but it was notorious throughout all the services is the, you know, the SF medic course, that's where you drink from the fire hose. Uh, it, only the strong survive. They cut the wheat from the shaft. Uh, really academically challenging. Academically, all, all the didactics, you know, you had, you had hands-on tests mm. that we, you know, we'd have massive failure rates. Uh, you know, people falling by the wayside all of the time on uh, people on academic probation all the time. And uh, I went in with a plan and basically I, you know, one thing that I had learned, but, you know, by the, by this point I'd, I'd been in the military a little while, um, uh, around 10 years. And I'm, I, I knew, I knew how to be a soldier and I, I meant I, and that meant that I knew how to plan an operation and also plan, uh, for myself as an individual. So I came up with a plan, a plan for how I was going to study the material, how I was going to keep myself honest and keep myself true to the academics, um, I, uh, I formed a, a study group. Uh, we met once a week. Um, uh, we all had individual, we, we broke down the study group like a team. We had individual duties. You know, we were each going to be a subject matter expert in certain things so we could help bring everybody else up to that level. Mm. And it was that new approach to academics that I kind of cultivated over my time in the SF medic course. And, you know, basically that meant uh, being the type of student that I was an operator, that I was a soldier. 
uh, as opposed to, as to just being the type of slacker that just can, you know, f- phone it in until test day and then, you know, get a passing grade on the test and just squeak through. Uh, because again, I knew that, you know, everything I learned in this, you know, not only is it extremely challenging, uh, extremely high failure rate, but again, everything that I learn, this, they're teaching me this for a reason. So this has the potential to save lives. So I really need to know this. And then uh, it was that mentality and approach to academics that I carried over when I did decide to go back and get my undergraduate degree. Um, and it's, you know, obviously it worked. I was a much better, much better student at Campbell University getting my BHS than I, than I was in high school and than I was uh, when I went to Georgia Southern briefly. So, Mike, and uh, the one thing I did want to touch on was from from your book and from uh, I've seen a couple other podcasts that you've been on, you know, so the audience understands you you started as far as medical school, things like that. It was mm-hmm. it was much later, later in life. Correct. Yeah, I started med school at uh, 36. So I had 17 years in the military at that point. Uh, I was uh I was a uh, master sergeant. So I was a sergeant first class, but I was on the master sergeant's list uh, when I got commissioned as a second lieutenant and, and went to USIS, went to med school. So yeah, I was 36, graduated med school at 40. I was an intern at age 40. Um, so definitely, a, you know, typically uh, quite a few years older than my peer group at that point. Yeah, now that that's amazing to me. I mean, that just, I, I can only imagine how much drive effort that takes, but I'm also... I also would guess that from being older, you probably had some advantages too from life experience that, like you said, it probably helped you to get through it. Do you think, do you think as far as the timing from the person you were, the student you were, do you think if you went to medical school sooner, late, earlier in life, do you think you would have had the same success or do you think it would have been more difficult? Uh, I think it, in, in a lot of ways, it would have been more difficult. I, mean, I probably wouldn't have gotten in, you know, if... <laughs> <laughs> just because of the type of student I was when I was younger. So, you know, there were a lot of things that definitely helped me. Um, it's, uh, and I was probably just, if I, if I'd have been four years older, it probably, you know, the difference, you do have less neuroplasticity as you get older, you know, it, it is hard, harder to learn things. I mean, this has been proven. Um, so if I would have waited probably even four years, just as a common, a combination of loss of neuroplasticity, kind of being set in my ways, a um, little bit harder to adjust sleep cycles as you get older. So that would have started to, to pay it. I mean, I definitely in, uh, in residency, I, I felt it and I, I felt it probably more than a lot of my classmates did, you know, when I had to work swing shifts and, and, and change from, from night to evening to day and back again. Uh, so definitely, and I've always had a problem with, with sleep issues anyway, so definitely took a toll on me, but, uh, I think I, I really, I think attended medical school and kind of a sweet spot for me. That's, you know, I, I had accomplished pretty much everything I set out to accomplish, uh, as an enlisted operator and it was time to move on anyway. And, uh, you know, I just, I had just the right amount of maturity, but still youthful enough that it wasn't going to beat me down too much, I think. Yeah. And is that where, cause in your book, I mean, I, and that's some of the stuff I want to get into definitely. Cause I think that would be a big help. And and just for any, anyone listening, and I'm going to put links in this, obviously Mike has an amazing book out called honed. Um, I think it would benefit, especially for the older crowd, definitely read it. So Mike, when, with your experience, everything you've done, I mean, the, is, is writing that book, did that just kind of come to you or were you kind of something you thought about you wanted to do? Yeah. Uh, so when I started, when I, when I started having the, the mind of the warrior podcast, uh, and, uh, started having a little bit of a public presence, especially on social media through my, uh, the couple of seasons that I did on hunting Hitler, uh, I working as medical training director for sheepdog response. Um, I started to get a lot of emails from guys and, uh, and it was almost a lot of these emails were like clones of one another. You know, it was, it was guys right around my age, a little bit younger, a little bit older, kind of similar injuries, maybe similar concerns with, you know, how do I get back in shape? And, and I was always answering questions, you know, what, what do you do about, you know, I've got, I have these back issues. What should I do? Uh, what do you think about the carnivore diet? What do you think about the vertical diet? What do you think about keto? Um, what should I be eating? 
uh, am I too old to get into jujitsu? I've had this medical issue. I've had that medical issue. Will you vet this gym for me? Hey, I'm having trouble sleeping. Uh, you know, should I, do I need to take a multivitamin? Should I get on testosterone? So I was answering a lot of the same questions over and over and over again. And, and I had, I had made the joke kind of to myself that, you know, I need to just kind of save all these emails and that, you know, when, whenever anybody emails me, I can just shoot it, shoot it out to them. I've already answered that question, or I could send them a link, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I'll do like a blog page or something and I can just send them a link to the blog page and say, well, it's all on the blog page. Uh, but it didn't click. You know, you would think that that was the aha moment when it would click. Hey, this is the book that I need to write. And it actually didn't happen that way. What happened was I was actually writing a completely separate book and I'd been working on it for a while. And uh, I happened to meet Tucker Max, uh, who's a, a best-selling author and uh, was uh, owner and and was at the time was running a, a, a company, self-publishing company called Scribe. And uh, I sat down and talked with Tucker a little bit. We got introduced. Tim Kennedy introduced the two of us, and uh, Tucker and I had mentioned that yeah, you know, there's a book that I've been working on. And he said, "Well, let's talk about it." So we had a uh, we had a video, we had a Zoom call, and uh, I described the book that I was writing. And he was just the whole time he was shaking his head like, "No, no, no." And I go, well, "What's up?" He goes, "Well, you told me about this this company that you started because I I had just." kind of, I had just kicked off Graybeard at the time. Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a lot in the arena. You know, he goes, when I was watching you, you know, in, interact, cause I, I had gone to a sheepdog event. He goes, you know, you're giving people all this advice on hell, on how much water they should drink and what type of breakfast they should have, uh, on, you know, on sleep habits and, uh, natural supplements that they can, they can take, uh, to alleviate soreness and decrease inflammation. And he goes, he goes, people were just eating that stuff up. You know, he goes, you're, you're a doctor that's, you know, in playing to your strengths. This is, this is, you know, the, the other stuff that you're talking about, a lot of people are already talking about, he said, but you know, the, this little niche right here, this operator fitness, especially operator fitness for older guys, that's kind of all you. So that's, that's really the book that you should write those, this life and lifestyle book. So I set out and the, you know, the, I, I had this horrendously bad working title. I don't even remember what it was, but it had gray beards in, in it. It was, and it was this overly long title that was really confusing. Uh, but basically what I did is I went through old, my send folder, uh, from old emails and my old podcast episodes. And I already had 90% of the material there. I just had to put it in a nice format. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it flowed and, uh, it, I injected some anecdotes in there to show how these reflected on my own life experience and then, you know, put bullet points at the end. So it, it soups and nuts. It only took me about six months really to write the book and, and get the final draft approved through editing. And, and we were on our way to the presses because I had so much of the work done already, which is, you know, and this, this is the book that, uh, thousands of people have read and has been really, really well received. I've been, uh, I spent, uh, I don't know how many weeks, uh, at the top of the Amazon charts. I was number one in six categories and I was ranked in eight different categories and, uh, it's just done really well. The reception has been amazing. Uh, I think we're right at 600 reviews, I think now on Amazon, it's like 4.6 stars or something. So I've been really, and most of the bad reviews are people that hate me for other reasons, uh, which you can tell by reading them, <laughs> but, uh, it's, I've been really pleased with it. And, and it, it helped me in writing the book too, into kind of, kind of shore up some, of some of the things that I was already doing, but maybe not doing well enough because I knew when I wrote the book, I'm like, I, I can't talk the talk and not walk the walks. So, Actually, you know, simultaneously while I was writing that book, I was I was tightening up my own fitness regimen, tightening up my diet and my sleep and and my supplementation and everything else. And uh, it's definitely, I think, just writing the book uh, uh, extended my life. So you know, I, I you know, both in quantity and quality. So I hope it will do the same for others. Mike, I really think it will. I mean, it was definitely um, it was definitely one of the books that i read and i you know i want to give you compliments to well whoever came out with the cover for the book i just want to tell you the cover is what caught my eye <laughs> and it made me stop yeah and then i start reading it and i'm like oh i have to i gotta i gotta get this book um but i i definitely think it did, it, did you see it on, did you just happen upon it on, on amazon or, or how did it happen yeah yeah on amazon yeah. because yeah. 
you know, just, I mean, and again, people want to hear you, not me, but high level, man. I was at 47. I was like 267, mm-hmm. five Didn't, foot five. Yeah. I was on yeah. heart medicine and wow. it was like, I better do something, man. You know, I, you know, I've told some people this, I, I, I call it the story of eight. I finally, a cardiologist who said to me, listen, you got eight friends. I said, yeah, why? He goes, you're going to have a heavy coffin that they're going to have to carry. Damn. Wow. Yeah. That's, you know what that's, but that's a good cardiologist that he'll put it to you that bluntly. Cause the, one of the big weaknesses in, in Western medicine nowadays is, uh, is doctor. I, I got it. I got it into an argument with a physician and he was telling me thing, you know, I was saying things that I will say to patients and he was like, Oh, you know, that's, I'll never say any of that and blah, 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 and body positivity. And that's, and he said, uh, he said, I just, I think I care more than you do. And I said, no, you're a fucking coward. Mm. Pardon my French. No, uh, it's true. you know, and, that, and that's the problem is so many physicians are, they're cowards because they don't want you to walk out and write the bad Yelp review or to call the hospital administrator and say, he hurt my feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I've always been pretty blunt with patients and, uh, I, and I had to temper that I had a, I had a, a time period where I was. I was really being an ass to patients and that was in, in residency because I was so bitter. Uh, and I, and I had to temper that. And I, and basically I, I had a, a patient chew me out is what kind of tightened up my shock group. And I realized that I was, uh, I was taking out my anger. This is all transference. You know, I was taking out my anger on patients and I was giving them the right message, but I was giving it the wrong way. You know, I was basic, I was, and, and I guarantee none of them were taking any of my advice. So moving forward after that, I, I, I totally, I didn't change my messaging or I didn't change the core of the message, but I changed how I was delivering the message. And I'm, I'm always, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, you know, what do you mean? You don't have a tetanus shot, you know, or, you know, yeah, you really do need to lose weight or you need to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, these, you know, I'll, I'll fall on my sword for those messages. And, you know, even I've even had patients tell me in the middle of me telling them that like, uh, look, you're really upsetting me about this. And I said, good, I want you upset because that's, that's how important this is. Mm. You know, if, if you're just laughing it off, then, then I'm not delivering it, you know? And I'm look, I'm saying, look, you know, I, I, I've told patients, I care more about your health than I do my online reviews or my paycheck. You know, to be quite honest, because, you know, I, I, I got in this, but I didn't even know, I had zero idea how much a doctor made when, when, when I went to medical school, I didn't know how much an emergency physician could make until I retired and got my first job outside of the military. I had no idea that that's how much money that I could be making. Hmm. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, I, I never got into this. I mean, primarily I got into this because I wanted to provide uh, the highest level of medical support to operators at the tip of the spear, which is what I, what I did for the last six years of my career. Um, uh, but I definitely never got into it because I wanted a, a lap pool at my house or, you know, I, I wanted a, uh, you know, a, uh, a winter house and ask winter condo in Aspen or anything like that. Those, those were n- never on my list. Uh, of why I wanted to practice medicine. So, and I think that gave me a little bit of leeway uh, in, in how I, you know, mu- much like when I was at my terminal rank, you know, my last four years in, and I knew that I never, I didn't want to get promoted. I would have turned down promotion. Uh, that gave me a lot of leeway that there were, there were things that I could say to the hospital commander that nobody else would say to the hospital commander. And I had the hospital commander pull me aside and tell me how much she appreciated it. She said, you know, this is, you know, having you around with your, I don't give a shit attitude. You know, the, it's not that you don't give it, you, you do give a shit about the things that are important, but you don't give a shit about anybody looking at you sideways or say, or, oh my God, you said that the wrong way. And, uh, she said, it's, it's really helpful to this, to the system. And I hope you know that. Yeah, it definitely is, man. I mean, honestly, I wish I would have met a doctor like you years ago, maybe in my thirties. You know what I mean? Like I needed that. Like now me. You know, and I think everybody's different, but like the way you're describing how you were in that phase, like I would have responded better to somebody like that. You know, mm-hmm. I, I tell people now too, you know, and I get it. Like people can be assholes the way they may talk about somebody's weight or things like that. But like for mm-hmm. me, I, you know, I wish 
I wish somebody would have fat shamed me instead of telling me I looked mm. fine or I carried my weight well, right? It was all bullshit and mm. it was hurting me, you know? So I like to tell people, man, I wish you would have fat shamed me because I was fat ashamed. And yeah, I really, I really have turned it around and it's because of good for you, like man. That. And people like, people like you and, and your book, man. So like, I, I didn't, I definitely wanted to tell you that, man, that your book definitely had an impact on me. And it, it, you know, I think seeing a guy like you basically putting your money where your mouth is and doing it, it just, it's helpful, you know? And I think a lot of people need to need to hear that. Um, so, you know, you're, I did want to, you mentioned it a little bit and I, I'd mm-hmm. be crazy if I didn't ask, I was a huge <laughs> fan of the show hunting Hitler. <laughs> Um, how did that come about? Well, uh, so of course, you know, they did one C I, I was on C there was, it went for three seasons. I was on the second and third season. Mm-hmm. Uh, my buddy Tim did the first season and we, we actually didn't know each other all that well, uh, when he did the first season and, um, we had a, we had a lot, uh, there was only one degree of separation. We had a lot of common friends and, uh, both in group and in the MMA community. Cause at the time I was working, uh, as the, as the fight house doctor for the Fort hood fight house, Colton Smith was the NCOIC. So, you know, mm-hmm. Colton, uh, a UFC, uh, alumnus, uh, and friend of Tim's and, you know, Tim has cornered him multiple times. And, um, I got put in touch with Tim and, uh, he had been on my podcast. We had spoken on the phone a few times. Um, we were Facebook friends. And then after, Season one of Hunting Hitler, they were just wrapping up. Tim put out a call looking for uh, some special oper- uh, a special operations vet, uh, basically to be kind of like a counterpart to him. That Tim would Tim would be on the South America team, and this this other individual would be on the European team. Mm. Uh, it was, was the the overall plan for for season two? And uh, I contacted Tim. He passed on my resume to the production company. Uh, production company liked me, did a video interview, uh, that I was their number one draft choice. Uh, the, uh, network didn't want me on the show. (laughs) They wanted, uh, they wanted a, uh, younger, taller, better looking version of me. Um, so they looked for a younger, taller, better looking version of me for a couple of, about a, a month or so, uh, and they found it apparently. So, and they gave the job to him and within hours of them giving the job to him, he had a family emergency and he couldn't go. And they re- immediately reached back out to me and they said, are you still interested in doing this? And I was st- on active duty at the time. Mm. Uh, and, uh, I was on my glide path to retirement. I said, well, I got enough leave saved up. I can, I can go do the show for a month, then come back out process and retire. And that was the plan was I was going to, go to Spain and Morocco and I was going to do three episodes and, mm. uh, and that was it. So I got hired to do three episodes and after two days of shooting, uh, or I know I, I say back after about three days of shooting, we had a day off and, uh, uh, I was, uh, sitting out behind the hotel, drinking a whiskey and smoking a cigar. And the, the director, Jeff Daniels asked me, he said, Hey, you want to go to South America? He goes, you know, we're going to do this a lot like season, like the first season, you know, we're going to go to South America. There's going to be a finale episode. We've already got, you know, we think what we think what we know what we're going to find. We already got it mapped out. He goes, I'd love to see you and Tim working together. Mm. You know, it'd be like a, like a, he's to be like a, a, one of those crossover comic books, right. Or, you know, you get a team up between Batman and Captain America. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to. And he said, all right, I'll, you know, we'll, you know, keep, keep an eye on your schedule and we'll, uh, We'll see what we can do. So, you know, I knew because he he gave me like a rough time period. So I did exactly what I said I was going to do. I got back from from shooting in Spain and in Morocco, out processed, got my retirement paperwork, got uh, got my DD two fourteen, was out of the military, and I started work uh, at a civilian hospital. And then they called up and they said, "Hey, yeah, we're doing this. Uh, you ready to go?" And I said, uh, yeah, let me get the time off, which I did. The hospital wasn't real crazy about it and, uh, went and did two more, the, the other two episodes, the South American episodes that I did. Uh, and then ultimately we got picked up for a third season. I went and shot the third season. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was good stuff. I did, you know, subsequently 
I had a pilot uh, that I did for another show, the same production company that didn't get picked up. I had a couple other projects that I was working on uh, that there was some interest in. And I did do a uh, three-part D-Day documentary, which is also on Amazon. It's called Normandy 44. Mm. I did that with James Holland, who who okay. I was on Hunting Hitler with. That was a lot of fun. And I, I had a ton. Initially, I had a ton of ideas of all these shows that I wanted to do. I had all these treatments that I submitted. A lot of them actually generated uh, some interest. Uh, but then uh, one of them... Uh, I came really close to making and in the end with everything I've got going on right now, I decided I'm like, you know what? I just uh, picking up and traveling and, you know, spending three nights in one hotel and going somewhere else and spending three nights in another hotel and doing that for months on end. Uh, I just don't feel like doing that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, if, if the ideal role came along, I would do it. Um, definitely if I got offered something in, in scripted, uh, cinema or television, I would do it. Cause that's actually always been a lifelong dream of mine, but, um, doing docu-reality, I think, uh, unless I got offered something really, really good. I think, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. Well, I hope it works for, it works out for you. Cause I, I, I love, I, I mean, I told you, I love the show. I loved hunting Hitler. Um, and Hey, I had to, I wanted to give you a chance here because, I heard Tim tell a story from mm -hmm. his perspective uh -huh. of Hitler. He mentions your name. So uh -huh. it was in the episode where Tim kind of was in the house and they said, Hey, you can't leave. Yeah. And, I, and I don't, you. that didn't, I don't think that made it into because of, because of everything that went on in that house. I think yeah, you must've read Tim's book. Cause I know mm -hmm. he mentions it in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what happened was they flew me to Chile and actually for the first week I was, uh, I was in country. I didn't have any scenes. Mm. So it was kind of weird. Um, and then, and they even said they're like, yeah, in retrospect, we probably could have waited to, to, you know, flown you in later. But, uh, and what ended up happening was, uh, there was, they went out to shoot. Uh, Tim and Gerard, God rest his soul. Gerard, uh, passed away last year. Uh, they went out to interview this family and the, the family, uh, uh, mom and dad, the, the matriarch and patriarch of this family. I don't, I think they were first generation, but their parents had been Nazis who had fled. And, uh, they had said in a pre-interview talking about all basically high ranking Nazis that would come to their house when they were kids, uh, have parties where they're, where their medals at the parties and everything else. So this was basically a direct contact to a lot of, uh, you know, high ranking officials from the third Reich that had fled to South America. So Tim, uh, Tim, Gerard, the, the crew, the translator, they go to this house, they're interviewing them. Uh, interview goes uh, as they thought it was going to go. They got all the information and they're getting ready to leave. And, uh, the kids show up, the adult children of, of these people they're interviewing show up and they had no idea what was going on. And they're like, what, what is this? And somebody explained it and they didn't like that. They felt that their parents had been maybe taken advantage of. And they're like, Oh my God, the, the family secret is going to be out there. You know, for everyone to see, we don't want the family secret out there. Well, mean, meanwhile, I'm back at the hotel and the plan was when they got back, there was a gym right next to the hotel. Tim, Tim and I were going to go work out and, uh, uh, then everybody, everybody, we were all going to have dinner together. And so, uh, I'm texting Tim. I'm like, Hey man, what's going on? It's, you guys are supposed to be back already. And he's like, uh, there's been an issue police may be involved. And then he was like, send something else. It was like, there's our threats of violence on the table or something like something weird. And I'm like, Oh shit. And I'm like, and I knew I had the call sheet. So I knew exactly where they were and it wasn't that far away. So I'm like, I'm like, can you just leave? And he's like, they've locked us. It's gated. They've locked us in. And I'm like, Oh shit. So I go walking out front of the hotel and there's like three or four cabs sitting there and uh, all the cab drivers are kind of clustered over smoking 
and but all the cabs are there and i'm thinking you know i could take a cab over there but then you know how am i going to get in and i'm looking at, at the and i'm like you know i could I, depending on what this gate's like maybe we could ram through the gate but there's no way that i'm going to convince that cab driver to just ram through the gate so i said <laughs> i text him and i said i said can you see the gate question mark i said I can steal a cab. Do you think? Do you think I? Do you think I could get enough of a run to break through the gate? Question mark. And he, and he sends back, "Hold off on that." And I'm looking, and I'm like, I'm judging which one of the cabs I'm going to get. I'm like, I'll bet the keys are in it. So if I just if I get in this cab, like I'm gonna I'm gonna have to you know I'm, I'm planning how I'm gonna walk over there without them coming over. Oh, you need a cab? You need a cab? And I'm like, I can get in. And I could just fucking take off. And uh, about that time, the the police actually showed up. Uh, and I think he talks about this in there. And when the police showed up, uh, they showed him. They were like, look, we got a contract. We paid these people to be on camera. We have a signed contract that says exactly what we're going to ask them. And uh, the, the adult kids of this couple even said... Uh, we're holding them here. If they pay us $10,000, we'll let them leave. <laughs> and the Chilean policeman said, so you're basically admitting to kidnapping and that you're going to make them pay to be set loose. Is that what you're telling me? And then they realized what it was they were saying. And they're like, oh, well, okay, never mind, never mind, never mind. But just to kind of make it all go away, they just decided, you know, what, we're just not even going to use any of that footage uh, because we don't want anybody coming back later. And trying to say we didn't mean to say that we didn't want to say that They're like we're we're not even we're not even going to risk any of it you know we're just all that's going to go on the cutting room floor. But they got back and you know Tim said, "Hey man, I really appreciate you having my back." I said, "Well, you know, you would have done the same for me." Uh, I said, "You know, I'm glad we didn't have to figure out what was gonna what was gonna win between the cab and the gate." Uh, and he said, "Well, judging from the gate, I said I think the gate might have won anyway." So. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't have to find that out. <laughs> man, that's that's such a great story, man. And and for me, being a fan of the show, it even adds more more to it. So, so I, I won't put you on the spot, but I do I, like doing this show. Mm -hmm. I won't ask you what your what your opinion is, but would you at least say that you you've seen a lot, and by doing that show, that may have you know really given you an opinion either way, whether he escaped or not. Yeah. Um, well, we can we can talk. I will say this, that, that, you know, we always felt everybody kind of had different ideas going into it. And, um, I think Tim and I were the only ones in talking to everybody, Tim and I were the only ones that, Hey, we're completely agnostic to whether he got out or not. We are open to all evidence, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to treat this as we would, you know, gathering intelligence in a, in a military fashion that, you know, we're not here to make decisions. We're here to find facts and report those facts to hire. And then, you know, the, the the culmination of the facts will be judged on its merit and we'll determine, you know, what's true, what's not true, what's feasible, what's not feasible. That was our opinion. Uh, you had other members of the cast who were either diehard convinced he a hundred percent got out and that's, and we're here to prove that. Hmm. Uh, and you had other members who were, uh, like, uh, no, there's no way in hell he definitely died in the bunker, but this is an interesting premise. Uh, so yeah, so I'll do the show. Uh, and then he had at least one cast member who said, "I don't give a, I don't give a shit either way. Like I'm just here to show up and look in the direction they tell me each day and whatever." Um, but we all agreed, and we had you know I had multiple conversations with with Tim and Gerard and and James and and Lenny that you know it. If regardless of what anybody watching the show believes, regardless of what any of us believe, the everything that we're uncovering about how the whether Hitler got out or not, his philosophy definitely did. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of the money that he stole definitely did. A lot of his higher ups definitely did. So this, you know, and you know, the 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 philosophy was always more dangerous than the man anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, the fact that the philosophy exported and you see so many so much evidence of that you know for years to come you know in the in the pinochet regime uh among others 
um, you know, this this is why we're here. This is these are the stories that we need to tell. You know, Colonia Dignidad and 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 the atrocities that went on there. Mm. Uh, you know, these are the stories that we need to tell. And uh, there was even talk uh, after season two. We talked. Uh, you know, and, and James Holland specifically brought up, he said, why don't we change the name of the show instead of hunting Hitler? Why don't we call it hunting evil? Mm. And they're like, Oh no, no, we need hunting Hitler. That's the hook, right? That's what brings people in. But to answer your question on my own personal beliefs, uh, uh, in between seasons, I, a lot got uncovered because that's even when we weren't shooting, um, I was always doing research. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, I, I took, I took my role very, as an investigator, very seriously. And I was on, you know, I, I was talking t- on the phone to everyone from retired Mossad agents to, uh, the, the Russian archives, the Moscow archives where the bone fragments are held. Mm. And, uh, uh, I uncovered basically what I found out is, uh, the, the premise of hunting Hitler was based on entire an entirely different documentary that had been like a maybe a one hour documentary, mm. where they did the DNA analysis uh, of the skull, and uh, uh, you know that that this was a very short documentary on a different network. They just kind of posed the question, you know, could he have gotten out? And then uh, come to find out, you know, I talked to a couple of different people that were involved with that project, to include one of the lead archaeologists. And, uh, I started to uncover some holes in that original theory and then come to find out, uh, nobody had, nobody had ever really that DNA analysis that was supposedly done on that skull in the Russian archives. Nobody can verify who Mm. did it or how it was done. And that was a huge gaping hole that nobody had addressed. Mm. Um, and, uh, after finding that out, uh, we ended up not doing a season four um, because we really didn't have the material to do it. Mm. Um, uh, they were thinking about doing it anyway. It would have been a rehash uh, of a lot of the stuff we'd done in the other three seasons. And I'm glad we didn't because what ended up happening is right at the time period where we would have been a month into shooting for season four, there was a team of French forensic dentists that got access to the bone fragments in Moscow, got access to the jawbone, and were able to definitively show that that, those were Hitler's teeth. Mm. So the bones in Moscow are Hitler's. So so Hitler's job, regardless of where the rest of them might be, Hitler's jawbone was picked up by the Russians and, and it is in Moscow. And this, it was, I don't want to say, we'll say it's 99.999% from from being irrefutable they weren't allowed to pulverize anything so they couldn't do actual dna analysis but it was a hundred percent match with all of his dental work and it wasn't the the theory that oh it's a body double and they just did the same dental work on him was completely refuted by a couple of things number one the dental work all had wear patterns that showed that that was uh, there were appropriate for the time periods like this you know the crown that he got three years ago had three years of wear on it so Mm -hmm. You know, in order to duplicate that, you would have had to have every single time Hitler went to the dentist, his body double would have had to gone to the dentist and get the exact same procedure done. Um, Also, they were able to do scrapings uh, and they found no animal proteins at all in the in the analysis. It was all vegetable proteins. And we know that Hitler was a vegetarian. So that matches. And then finally, the teeth were stained blue as they would have been if somebody bit down on a cyanide capsule. And we know that he held the cyanide capsule between his teeth when he fired the, the round through his, uh, through his skull. So, uh, and that matched as well. So again, uh, it's, is it DNA analysis? No, but it's as close as you can get. So, you know, when people ask me about it now, Hey, when are you coming back for a four season? I'm like, well, hmm. you might not have heard about this. There, there can't, you know, even if they decided to revive it, there couldn't be a four season simply because of this. Now, you know, we could go back and do hunting evil. There's plenty of, cause we picked up a lot of Nazi trails. Mm. Uh, uh, there was, there was, there were some interesting side quest stuff that came up, uh, in the course of shooting in between seasons that we never really got to explore. Um, which is, 
you know, pretty interesting as, and uh, we could talk about that for hours. You know, the things that we found in Altice in, in Austria specifically, um, were pretty suspicious, uh, you know, cause that, that has to do with, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, that's where Carlton Brunner got captured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, uh, if you look at the, the nuts and bolts of how he got captured, it's, it a hundred percent reads like he wasn't even trying to get away. Like maybe he was a, a decoy for somebody else. Mm. And we also know that that's the same, that, uh, at one point Eichmann had gone through that same rat line to get it out. So then the question always was, uh, you know, was, was Carlton Brunner just a distraction for Eichmann or was he a distraction for somebody else to get out? Uh, there's some, definitely some unanswered questions there. I'll tell you what, if you guys do hunting evil, I'm all in, man. I would, I would love that. I mean, just hearing, you know, I I hadn't heard about what you just told me. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. I won't lie. Part of me is a little disappointed, but it's, it's great knowledge though, to hear that, um, hear that. But yeah, if you guys ever did, did that, uh, follow up on hunting evil, that would be, cause I, I thought the whole, it wasn't just for me. It wasn't just about Hitler. I mean, I thought you guys were finding interesting things the whole the whole time. And I, I thought it was fascinating. So, you know, anybody who hasn't watched it, you know, even though what, what Mike just said, I still recommend watching it. It's still definitely, definitely worth it. So, well, Mike, this has been, this has been a blast, man. I mean, this has been fun for me, man. I, um, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I was, uh, when you, uh, when you messaged me back and said something like, hell yeah, I'll do it or whatever you said, I was like, <laughs> I was literally at the gym that day when you responded to my email and I looked at my guy I work out with, I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. And, Cause he knew the show too. So it was, yeah. it was great. So yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for making, uh, making my day, man. I really, really appreciate <laughs> well, it. Well, thank so, you, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate being on. I love, you know, I, I love my, my wife says I love to harangue and I do. So, uh. Yeah, it's uh, I. I always, where whenever anybody reaches out and says, "Hey, you know, will you do this or do that?" I, I always, unless I've got something just you know really burning going on, or or unless I you know, uh, there has been one time that I researched the person, and I'm like, "Yeah, this is not a person. That I, I definitely don't want that person interviewing me." <laughs> uh, but a, a pleasure to be on, man, and thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and everybody, I will put some uh, some links in uh, for Mike's Mike's book. Some uh, Mike Mike, real quick, is there anything else you got going on right now that you'd like anybody to uh, check out? Yeah, so uh, my website is graybeardperformance.com, and that's my life and lifestyle brand. That's where I sell my supplements. I just launched my third SKU, my third uh, supplement, uh, just over a week ago. It's my Vitality Formula. And it is just rocketing off the shelves. Like the the reception has been just amazing. I knew it was going to be big. I didn't know it was going to be this big. Uh, and basically, it's a uh, it's a it's an an optimizer for lack of a better word. So I it's cordyceps mushrooms, resveratrol, and uh, some amino acids. The the combination of which will uh, increase your oxygen utilization, will increase your focus, uh, help with mood. Uh, there's some, uh, and this is all stuff that has clinical trials to back it up. I don't put mm. bullshit in any of my supplements. You know, I, I do the, these are, this is all stuff that I've been taking for years, uh, because I, I, I went to PubMed and I looked up the trials to see if they were reputable. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, uh, everything that's, that's in this, uh, is beneficial shown to increase blood flow, increases nit- nitric oxide production. So in a sense, it's an organic Viagra. Your results may vary. Uh, but, uh, so far the, the reception to it has been just tremendous. And I hope that that continues. Well, I'm definitely going to give that a, give that a look also. So yeah, I'll make sure I put the links in the uh, show notes and listen, Mike, thank you again. It's been an honor for me, man. And obviously thank you for your service to our country. Thanks for everything you're doing to help older guys like myself out. Uh, you, you're still continuing to uh, to help people. So thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, this take has care. been the Bear Essentials. Thanks for listening. And remember, never hibernate on your goals.